services at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. Or you can call us at 206-684-0464. The presentation will also be available on our blog, Front Porch. The chat feature will only be available the chat feature will only be available for questions right after a speaker's presentation and at the end during our Q&A portion. Be disabled at all other times. There will also be opportunities for phone questions after each speaker. You can press star six to unmute your phone to ask questions or use the raised hand feature if you are on your computer and you will be called upon to speak your question during this times. You can also use your raise hand feature from your phone by pressing star three to raise your hand and star three again to lower your hand. In order to bring you the most relevant information, we have created a survey for your feedback. The link will be posted in the chat at the end of our presentation uh, for your convenience. We have begun incorporating community and neighborhood members and organizations to present information about work going on in our communities. This is an opportunity to highlight work related to COVID-19, as well as reopening and recovery that is being led by community. It is important for, to us to provide a platform to highlight these conversations and efforts. If your organization would like an opportunity to be a feature presenter, please email us at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov and we'll get back to you. Today, we will be hearing from King County Executive's Office and Public Health Office the City of Seattle Innovations and Performance Team, the Seattle Public Library, Seattle Parks and Recreation, Seattle Office of Labor Standards, the Seattle Special Events Office, as well as Refugee Artisans Initiative, a community partner. We welcome and thank all of the presenters here today. To begin our presentation, I'd like to introduce Acting Director of Seattle's Department of Neighborhoods, Sarah Morningstar. Sarah? Thank you, Patty. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Morningstar, Acting Director of the Department of Neighborhoods for the City of Seattle. I'm filling in for our Department Director, Andreas Mantilla, who is currently on parental leave with a healthy, brand new addition to their family. We do miss him, but wish him lots of love and joy. I want to thank everybody that continues to participate on this webinar, both as presenters and participants. We are fortunate to have representation from various departments as well as external partners this week to bring you information on our open, reopening and recovery efforts. There have been many new developments, however, since our last Department of Neighborhoods webinar. I would like to mention a couple COVID-19 related items. On Thursday, June 18th, Mayor Durkin issued an executive order to extend the City of Seattle COVID-19 closures and relief policies. This follows King County's application to be in phase two of Governor Inslee's Safe Start Washington plan. While some businesses are allowed to resume, they are to do so under strict public health guidance, while also continuing to ban almost all gatherings. It makes clear that residents and businesses should follow public health measures like social distancing, face coverings, and good hygiene. Governor number two, Governor Inslee issue, issued an order effective today, June 26, making face coverings mandatory. Every Washingtonian over the age of five must wear a facial covering when in a public space as mandated by the public health order. This includes all indoor spaces and outdoor public spaces where when social distancing so, cannot be maintained. Okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks. For the, for these resources and more, please see the City of Seattle COVID-19 research page at www.seattle.gov backslash mayor backslash COVID-19 or the Washington State Coronavirus COVID-19 response page at coronavirus.wa.gov. That one's probably easier to remember. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the events of the last several weeks and the call to action from our communities to, ad to address police brutality and the centuries of racial and economic injustice. We acknowledge just how necessary and powerful these calls to actions are and dawns two North Stars that we use to guide our work and hold ourselves accountable. 
at the Department of Neighborhoods, where they are, put race and equity at the center of all decisions and actions, and invest in the power of communities to forge their own solutions. As a part of Seattle City Government, we at the Department of Neighborhoods know we most must intentionally work to counter the legacy of injustice and the systems that are so often causing harm to black communities, indigenous communities, and all communities of color. We remain committed to centering ra racial and social justice in our work. Most importantly, we remain committed to investing in those communities that have been harmed by the institutional racism entrenched in our government and our society. We invite anyone and everyone that has joined us in this work, from community groups to business associations to historic societies to neighborhood councils and beyond, to stand in solidarity with us and the community and to invest in actions that centering black communities, indigenous communities, and communities of color. Lastly, on behalf of the Department of Neighborhoods, I would like to thank you all for letting us share this information we have and hope that you will also share your questions with us as well as your thoughts and concerns. These continue to be unprecedented times and I know that we will continue strong and united as the community of Seattle together. Thank you and stay healthy. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, appreciate your words and your thoughts, and we do miss and uh, wish a lot of love and joy to Andres and his new addition. Um, moving on now, I would like to introduce from King County Executive's Office, Callie Knight. Callie? Hey, Patty, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, thanks, sorry about that, folks. Hi, everyone, Callie Knight here from uh, Executive Constantine's office. Um, I'm just here to provide a quick update about our Seattle COVID-19 response facilities and then the um, mask uh, distribution program that we have. Um, so I'll try, as of today, have one isolation and quarantine center open in the city of Seattle. Um, Harborview Hall uh, closed. Um, Harborview decided to close that isolation and quarantine site due to lack of demand. But we have one isolation and quarantine site up at in North Aurora. Um, we have a few shelter deintensification sites where we've partnered with homeless service providers to help um, deintensify existing congregate shelters. And those um, are in, uh, I think there's one right across from Bailey Gatzert Elementary. There are a couple in Lower Queen Anne. And then we are looking to move some folks from Catholic Community Services shelters into a site at Elliott. However, we are still waiting for fire marshal approval to be able to move folks into that site. Um, so those are my quick updates about our COVID-19 response facilities. And then I wanted to also provide an update to folks on the line about our mask program. You may have seen that King County purchased 25 million cloth and disposable masks to distribute to our residents. Um, we were able to give the city of Seattle 200,000 masks to get out to city residents. Um, and so when the chat box is enabled, I will put the contact information for where you need to go if you are an individual who is interested in getting a mask. Um, but there are a couple of email addresses that were shared with me today that I wanna share out to the broader community. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and really appreciate the time. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we are currently experiencing some technical issues with our chat feature. Uh, I, at this time, I will ask uh, if you're on a computer and you would like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself, uh, or if you are on the phone, you can hit star six to unmute if anyone has any questions for Kelly Knight and uh, King County's Executive's Office. Hi, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just say, state your name and, and go on ahead. Hello, I'm Mike with the Lake Forest Park Citizen Commission. Um, Ms. Knight talked about, uh, Executive Knight talked about, 
that's the next talks about you know war, My, mike war. uh you are you sound a little a little muffled if you could maybe get to the, the uh, microphone a little closer mike are you there okay so I, can you hear me now yes perfect please continue thank you okay Director Knight talked about a North Aurora location for COVID stuff. Is is that a reference to the Shoreline facility? And, and Hi, Mike. No, no, that's no, that is not a, that Shoreline facility. It was an assessment and recovery center and is no longer operational. This is a different location meant for isolation and quarantine, and it's within the city of Seattle. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, are there any other questions for Callie? Again, I apologize. We're still working on our chat feature, but you are able to speak by unmuting your microphone or hitting star six on your phone. Oh, hello there. Hi. Hi, I am just asking if someone that isn't muted could mute because we're hearing a lot of people yes. in the background and it's really distracting. If everybody could mute, if they're not going to talk to have their Thank you, Marta, for that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sorry we, for the interruption there. No, thank, thank you. you. We we do encourage. Again, I want to just reemphasize this is a new platform for all of us here. Um, we are uh, we ask for your patience and your grace in uh, getting through these technical issues. Um, speaking of, I believe we may have lost our presentation. Uh, can one of my colleagues, there we are. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions for Callie, Callie, thank you so much for being with us uh, and giving us those, those vital updates. Uh, we will be moving on um, next to our next speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce Matias Valenzuela from Public Health, Seattle and King County. Matias, are you there? I am. Hi, Matias. Go ahead. You're the floor. Can you Hello? hear me? Matias, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. So you have oh. the floor. Thank you. Oh, great. Sorry about that. It said that I'm muted. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. New technology. First time uh, that I use this platform as well. So, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, having uh, us and for uh, always organizing these uh, this webinar. Um, can we go on to the next slide or the, yeah, so this is just, I will be providing, um, uh, some, some updates in terms of where we are, are with COVID-19 from, uh, the public health, uh, director's uh, office. Um, and, uh, do want to start though, just by saying, because this is an important announcement that we made along with the executive's office this week is that we've declared racism, um, as a public health crisis. Of course, this is not uh, anything that is, uh, you know, for many of us, it's not a, a surprise. We've actually had this as a as a crisis uh, long before um, COVID. And so, really, just want to highlight that we are dealing with this double pandemic, one that has been with us for a long time and will continue to be uh, with us uh, uh, in terms of through the recovery and beyond. So, want to make sure that. Um, we're really focusing on this uh, issue as we discuss those things today and uh, into the future. So if we can go on to the next one, I wanna, um, this is very uh, busy slide. There's a lot of information here, but I wanna, public health is putting, uh, has six different dashboards, uh, some um, kind of just daily summaries of where we're seeing um, cases and uh, some of the key indicators. It's the ones on the right. We also have, uh, race and ethnicity dashboard, which I think I've maybe talked to this group at some point as well. Um, and wanna, what we have here, because I know there's going to be, um, we'll be touching on today uh, reopening and, and as we move through the phases. This, what you're seeing here on the left side is uh, really the, the key indicators of COVID activity dashboard. And this is what 
uh, we have worked on with the state to show are uh, the key indicators to show how we move through the phases and the things that we need to have in terms of um, public health to be able to continue to move safely through the phases. What um, the, this covers things such as COVID activity, so the numbers of cases that we're having, hospitalizations, uh, deaths, uh, our testing capacity, and also uh, healthcare system readiness. So we need to be able to actually have um, uh, you know, beds and ICU units available, respirators, those kinds of things. Not what is happening, for example, in Yakima right now, which is very concerning. So um, there have been some worrisome trends and really want to highlight this. You know, generally we have had the, the where it has the green is where we are in um, in good shape. Um, and again, this, I apologize that this is kind of small, but so you can go on the website and get it and, and make it uh, bigger. But really, you know, hospitalizations and deaths have uh, been decreasing and that's positive, but we have actually been seeing a steady increase and very concerning increase in, in cases. We're actually above the under 25 per 100,000 uh, rate target that we are looking for. Um, and also in terms of just the, the transmission, the RE, which is basically how, uh, how many people, anybody who is positive uh, transmits to. The, these are actually at a um, either a steady or increasing rate. So we have been uh, concerned um, about the trend that we've been seeing now for uh, over over a week. Uh, we uh, know that there are certain things that are going on. The, some of the issues around the racial disparities that we have seen early on, um, those have remained steady, uh, but we actually know, um, and we do case investigations, so we ask questions when we ask where people are getting infected. We know that um, actually the reopening is happen happening, having a, an impact. Uh, more transmission happening in places of work, in public places, um, we have some general sense uh, that there is increased transmission in community and there's also a uh, household uh, spread. So this again is of high concern for us at public health. Um, and really what we are asking is, and as we know, as we move through these phases, and I think there is an increasing sense uh, that as we move through here and we open up the economy and we have been reopening the economy, that actually the risk is lower and it's actually quite the contrary. We are, people now are more chance of being exposed, more chance of being in contact. And in fact, what, this is what we're seeing is increasing trends. Our health officer is quite concerned about this to the point that we are trying to see um, if things don't turn around, we actually might be really even considering going um, in a way backwards in terms of our, uh, our phases. Um, what this also means is we just need to be continue to have uh, taking those uh, steps that even we have uh, more reopening of businesses and other uh, settings, uh, the things that got us to get an initial um, low case count, especially um, after the initial big uh, surge or wave, physical distancing, face covering, washing hands, those kinds of things are things that we need to actually double down on and really uh, focus on uh, moving forward. And it's gonna be really needing a, a very strong community response around this. So again, I will, uh, I, I don't think this is something you'll be likely hearing more and more of this, I think in the news and also uh, looking at uh, different players such as the city of Seattle and other community partners and residents are on this call to really say, okay, what can we do now to actually um, be begin to see the trend go in the direction that we need to see it? And again, so this is very worrisome. We'll continue to uh, keep an eye on this. If we go to the next um, slide, we can see, um, uh, and I think folks know, we we have been uh, in a process. We we submitted early last week. We submitted our application to the state. We were um, told. Uh, approved and then officially on uh, last Friday, a week ago, we moved from a modified phase one to a full phase two. Um, and uh, this really um, begins to, the, the modified phase one was very similar to, uh, to the phase two. Um, uh, there are still uh, limits and I think there's gonna be more of a section here in this webinar around some of the specifics around this too, but there are still uh, limits on businesses, such as in terms of, of seating, 
Uh, this phase also allows for um, some more activity, such as uh, limited gatherings. So really, uh, such things as five or less people um, outside a household gathering. But I mean that even though it is a gathering, it means you still need to maintain a distance. So these are things preferably you would be outside uh, meeting with people, um, friends, family, those kinds of things, and maintaining uh, distance. But having, uh, you know, I think the message from public health is even though you can do this, doesn't mean you have to do this. And also those populations, older populations, people who have chronic uh, health conditions, immunocompromised, are still at increased risk. So that is going to be really um, uh, important to keep in mind. One of the things I'll just add to is terms of what's making up a large um, number of our um, cases. If early on, for example, we had long-term care facilities, and then um, you know we saw a rise in essential workers, uh, we've been seeing a lot in the 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 age group uh, in terms of uh, where we're seeing um, the surge in cases. So that's it's really important. Again, in those particular populations, that people actually take. Uh, the steps necessary to reduce transmission, to limit gatherings, uh, all of that. And we know it's it's challenging, especially as we get into the summer months and things, you know, we hear the economy uh, is opening up again and people are feeling confident, um, but it's actually, a, I, I would just say it's a false sense of confidence. If anything, there is plenty of um, COVID-19 in the community and these are risky situations that we are putting ourselves in when we go out. So to take the necessary steps, if we could, please. So if we go to the next slide, um, I was also asked to just talk about a bit of what's happening in terms of contact tracing. And um, this, the, the, the way that we have proceeded in our region and in the state is initially the, the state took on uh, pretty much all the contact tracing uh, that was uh, happening, and they've been uh, using some large teams to do this. But we in King County, what we uh, uh, decided to do uh, is to actually use, uh, begin a pilot, which now we're expanding. And eventually by mid-summer, we will be doing all the contact tracing uh, for King County. So what this really consists of, and this is key in kind of stopping and containing the spread, which is really uh, contact tracing consists of identifying people who come in contact with somebody who's been infected with coronavirus, who's tested positive. So those are things such as family members, friends, colleagues. Um, and then we have to, uh, one is a person who tests has to be rapidly isolated. Those who are the contacts have to be identified and then in quarantine and, and in quarantine for 14 days. So there's a whole system that goes into this, which public health Seattle King County has built and building up we have been um, hiring large numbers every week of contact uh, tracers. We've gotten um, hundreds and hundreds of applications. We are very much looking for uh, people from community uh, who know the community, who uh, speak uh, uh, other languages as well um, besides English. Uh, it's critical and to the, also that um, our uh, are knowledgeable of the community uh, ourselves. You know, they know the neighborhoods, they know the places where people go, they know uh, this is not something that you can actually internationally contract out to a call center, for example. So this system has been building up. We have hired folks from community and it will continue to do so through um, at least the next uh, month. We've also had uh, a large number of cases that are uh, Spanish speaking. So we have also partnered uh, with um, uh, CMAR, community health centers in terms of bringing some of their staff in to some of this, do some of this work. If we could go to the next slide, uh, just in terms of testing, and I think this is something that has continued to evolve. Uh, and the, the key take home here is that testing is uh, more widely available than it has ever been, which is extremely important. This, as we go back to that containing the virus, uh, box that I was showing before, testing is a key part of this and to be able to identify who's positive and, um, and then isolate uh, those people and then um, quarantine any of the contacts. There are some important um, you know, developments that have happened here and it's important to know now that it's a longer list of symptoms um, that, that we uh, list here. So things that have existed all along like fevers and chills and uh, cough and shortness of breath and difficulty breathing. 
but there are others now too. Um, uh, this happened some weeks ago already, new lo uh, like loss of taste or smell, but things such as also nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. So, and the also, also it's um, kind of the threshold of getting tested is lower. So if you have one of these symptoms, you should get tested right away. It's really important. Also, it's really important that we've been able to uh, now officially say that this is testing is free. So, um, and also, um, free for anybody and also regardless of immigration status. Um, if, uh, in, in testing sites, if you um, have a healthcare uh, provider and insurance, uh, in terms of insurance, you will be asked for an insurance card, but uh, generally if you don't, that, sh that will not be a barrier uh, to uh, testing. So just encourage folks to continue to uh, access um, uh, that. And especially if you have just one of those symptoms, get tested right away, it's very important. And if we go to the last slide, I'll just finish by talking about, and Callie Knight from the Executive Office was just talking about uh, the face coverings and some of the work that the Executive's Office is, is, is doing. Um, I'll just, we did have a directive for King County that um, was to uh, asking people uh, to use face covering. Uh, this was now has been uh, kind of uh, preempted or superseded by a state order that came out. Um, and is effective as of today. And this requires uh, individuals to wear uh, face covering if they're in indoor public places, um, stores, offices, restaurants, and also if you're outside, you can't stay six feet away from others. Um, there is, the ex this exceptions is different from our King County directive. Um, so it's important to uh, keep in mind that um, children under the age of five, um, are not uh, covered by by uh, this, so don't necessarily have to wear it. Also, people that have uh, certain conditions and uh, people with disabilities as well. We are working with the state around some of this. When we did ours, it was a directive, not an order again. And the fact that the state did it, did it as an order, it also put it in a category of a misdemeanor. We have been concerned about this direction and we have been working with uh, the state uh, to see if potentially even that there can be some adjustments to what they have already put out and even actually having it more in line with what we are doing in King County. We have been in contact also, um, not with all law enforcement, with the uh, Sheriff's Office for King County, and we're also reaching out to other law enforcement just so it becomes clear that this should not be uh, an enforceable uh, offense. We want this to be educational. We don't want the police to be actually um, enforcing this particular uh, order. So I think with, um, with that, that was the, the last piece of information that I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matias. Um, we appreciate you and Kelly Knight and the partnership of Seattle King County with us um, in providing this vital information. Um, at this time, uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, because of our chat feature situation currently, we're asking if you do have any questions uh, and you're at a computer, email us at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. Uh, we will be monitoring that and reading those um, live here. Again, COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. Uh, you can also unmute your phone to ask questions or uh, un use star six on your phones to, uh, sorry, unmute your phones using star six or unmute your microphone on your computer. Are there any questions for Matias? Hearing none, uh, again, thank you very much, Matias. Uh, we will be moving on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, I would like to introduce from the City of Seattle Innovation and Performance Team, Madeline and Rachel. Hello, can you hear us okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, again, I'm Rachel Cicero and my colleague, Madeline Hernandez as well. Um, go ahead and next slide, please. 
Great. Um, so as mentioned, we are with the city's um, innovation and performance team. And for those um, who may not know the history of this team, um, the team was created in 2017, bringing together staff into a new unit focused on improving the effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability of city government. We do so by partnering with city departments using data analytics and design thinking to solve problems creatively, work smarter, and redesign city processes for greater impact. Maddie. Great, thanks. Nice to meet everyone. I'm Madeline Hernandez, I'm the project lead for the innovation and performance team. Um, our team was asked to lead the work around reopening. Um, and so really working across departments and with our partners to make sure that we are our reopening efforts are streamlined um, and reinforcing what the state um, and public health are um, doing around reopening. Um, so today we're going to share a little bit about um, some toolkits that we just released, as well as how we're going to, moving forward, make sure that information is accessible and um, centralized around reopening through the city. So next slide. So today um, we are excited to announce that we just released um, some toolkits for businesses and community-based organizations. Um, I'm project managing a part of this reopening work around how can we better support um, our businesses and CBOs to make sure that they can operationalize um, the states and public health guidance. Um, so we, I've been working with Shannon Harris from Public Health um, to make sure that we're integrating information correctly. Um, and as you all know, the information is constantly changing. Um, and so we're doing our best to keep up with um, all the information to make sure it's correct. Um, in the toolkits, there's six different um, languages that we translated them into. Um, and each toolkit um, looks a little bit different based on the industry, but there's um, checklist, uh, with infographics to make it a little bit easier to understand um, what each of the guidance says. And I'll just note that the guidance that we included in the toolkits um, isn't like every single thing that is in the guidance, but rather the items that we felt like were really pertinent for people to remember and to operationalize the guidance um, in their different establishments. Um, and we also, um, to make these possible, uh, worked with US Digital Response. Um, and they work with, uh, do pro bono work for different government agencies um, on like digital and web-based work. So we're really appreciative to be able to share these with community um, and hope that they're a helpful resource to all of you. Um, so I'm gonna put, oh, I guess the chat's not working, but um, we'll make sure that you get the link to them so you can check them out um, and really would welcome any feedback uh, as we iterate on this process, um, knowing that information, again, is constantly changing. Um, our goal is to um, elevate them through our Department of Neighborhoods Community Liaisons um, program to make sure that um, now that we have this information translated that folks can be helped um, kind of in a one-to-one -one to support uh, to operationalize in their business. And then um, OED, the Office of Economic Development, continues to support small businesses through their call center. So if anyone has questions, they can call through that. Um, next slide. Um, and then, as I mentioned, all the toolkits are on this website and the link is there on the, the slide. Um, but kind of our next step around this is to think creatively about how we can um, better centralize the information um, so that people can easily access the different resources that are in the toolkit. So, for example, Rachel's, Rachel's going to go over um, the free testing sites that the city put up. Um, our colleague Leah led that effort. Um, SDCI, uh, the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, they just released um, an occupancy calculator to help support um, businesses and figure out what their reduced capacity is for their business, um, as well as the outdoor seating permits that are now free through um, Seattle Department of Transportation. So up here um, on the corner where it says COVID-19 on the website page, um, there's a drop down to access all those different information. Um, and we're also thinking about how to make interactive tools um, so that people can um, easier access that information. So next slide. 
Great, um, and we wanted to highlight this, uh, the free testing sites today, because as Maddie mentioned, um, we do allude to this in the toolkits as well. So we just wanted to provide a little bit more information here um, for those who haven't seen the toolkits. Um, so the city of Seattle is now offering free COVID-19 testing for all ages through a partnership with King County and UW Medicine. Um, this now accounts for 25% of King County's testing capacity, topping 1,500 tests per day or 17,000 tests uh, since the first test site launched back on June 5th. Um, this was really a human-centered design and data-driven program, which used tools from behavioral insights, empathy interviews, performance metrics, and even real-time feedback that's happening at the testing sites um, to design the whole flow and service of, of these sites. Um, this effort paid off resulting in major efficiency gains and glowing patient reviews. Um, as I said, there are um, feedback happening directly at these sites. And so we found it really great that community is willing to sort of give us their voice um, to let us know how we're doing and how we can improve. Um, there are currently two sites in Soto and Aurora. Uh, the photos here um, are just snapshots of the website. Again, this is part of the COVID-19 Mayor's Office webpage. Um, there is a link here for testing. Um, you can register both through the website um, or through the phone number that's listed here today. Um, it is now being recommended just for folks on the call um, that people get tested if they have been to any large gatherings um, or have developed symptoms uh, within, the, within 14 days. And again, you can learn more by visiting the website. There's also uh, FAQs about insurance um, and just how to register um, also regarding citizenship and immigration status. Um, they did want us to know that testing is available uh, regardless of that status as well. And I believe that's it. Thank you very much, Jessica. If you can go on to the next slide, I believe we have their contact information. So oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thank you. Um, yeah, feel free to email us anytime with questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline and Rachel. Um, at this time, uh, if anyone does have any questions for them, you can uh, unmute your microphones. You can hit star six to unmute your phones. You can also email questions to our email uh, and we will read them out loud as well. Uh, are there any questions for Madeline or Rachel at this time? Going once, going twice. Okay, seeing and hearing none. Uh, we're still monitoring the email, but seeing and hearing none, uh, I think we are going to go on and continue. Madeline, Rachel, thank you so much for that vital information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on now, I would like to introduce from Seattle Public Libraries, Allison Schwartz. Allison, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me okay, Patty and everyone? We can hear you, Allison. Can okay. please continue. Great. So thanks for inviting the library back to these community webinars. So I'm Allison Schwartz. I serve as the library's community partnerships and government relations lead. And today I'm just going to share some really high level information about our reopening planning, um, kind of a snapshot of current programs that we have available and some other timely and relevant resources. So next slide, please. So right now we have a cross-divisional team made up of dozens of library staffers that are at different levels of the organization um, who have been working on several phases as we move forward. So our planning is guided by the state's phase reopening plan that one of the earlier speakers had on um, in their slides, um, as well as the city's coordinated reopening planning, which um, Maddie and Rachel just spoke to. Uh, and as we do this work, we're really prioritizing the safety of both the public, our patrons and staff, and also wanting to make sure that as we look at planning our services that we're um, centering on equitable delivery of services. So here on this slide, I have laid out our phased approach. Um, we don't yet have firm dates or timelines as each phase is going to rely on kind of that public health data and guidance, but we'll definitely share this out um, as, as those dates are firmed up. So we do know that soon-ish, uh, you'll be able to return your books. Um, so when the library closed back on March 13th, we had a record 417,000 
physical items that had been checked out at that point. Um, and so now we're working out a timeline and a process for people to return those items and then how our staff is going to safely receive and process all of those. And we should be able to share details um, soon. What I can share now is that uh, we will start with a few branches um, with limited hours where folks can drop off uh, and then we'll test that out before expanding to additional locations. Um, I did want to mention as a reminder that there are no overdue or late fees uh, for library materials anymore. We eliminated that at the beginning of the year and due dates are continued to be extended during the closure. So um, no worries on that. Uh, so phase two, borrowing books. Right now we're in the process of planning some for some limited curbside pickup services that would be available by appointment. Um, again, starting with a few branches and adapting and expanding as we learn how that works. And then another component of phase two is that our mobile services team, um, so those are the folks that do the bookmobile and other um, kind of outside of the library outreach, is planning to offer some delivery to community partner agencies that are serving people who are most in need of physical books. Um, once we do hone in on dates, that all that information will be up on our website. We'll be sure to share with DON and other community partners so that everybody has that information. Um, I did want to mention that our digital collection has seen very high use during this time, so about a 40% increase in the use of ebooks and e audiobooks since the closure. So those, those items are still available for folks. And that we've also seen 5,500 new library patrons since the closure. Um, we developed a tool for folks to sign up for an e card online. Um, let's see, phase three and beyond in terms of getting back into library spaces. At this time, our buildings are still primarily closed to the public to help uh, mitigate the spread of disease in our community. We do, however, currently offer daily limited public restroom access at five different locations. Um, those are Central, uh, the Downtown Library, Ballard, Beacon Hill, Capitol Hill, and the University District. Those locations are open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, daily, uh, and those are, again, just for restroom access. Um, at this point, we do not yet have a target date for reopening all of our buildings fully to the public. Uh, we will not yet be hosting any in-person public programs or um, allowing for meeting room bookings until at least September 7th, which kind of aligns with um, some other city timeframes. When we do return to full service and reintroduce in-person programming, which we're all looking forward to, um, I think like most spaces, the library will look familiar, but it will, it will not be the same. We're adapting just like everyone, and so we'll have to be allowing for social distancing, you know, moving our furniture around, you're going to see decals on the floor, things like that. Um, but we are definitely looking forward to seeing and serving people um, in our branches and out in the community. So next slide, please. So until that time, uh, we do have a number of available programs and services, and I just wanted to touch base on a few here. Um, we're continuing to adapt and rethink our program to virtual spaces. Our Summer of Learning program is just around the corner in early July. We've got resources that encourage kids of all ages, so early learners, zero to five, and also K-5, and we've had some teen challenges as well. But we really want to make sure that kids are still reading and learning throughout the summer. So we're encouraging 20 minutes of reading a day. We have hired a number of teaching artists, um, primarily artists of color, to develop really short um, STEM and STEAM videos. Also, a bunch of our librarians have contributed to that content, too. Uh, we have a reading log that's available online, and that will be distributing um, in, I believe, eight languages in partnership with the school district at their meal sites, the summer meal sites as well across the city. Uh, we developed a new program in response to COVID and kind of to help move along um, our economic recovery. It's called Your Next Job, and it is a service that helps people who are disproportionately being left out of federal unemployment relief. So we are offering through that one-on-one um, -on -one reference appointments to help folks acquire skills around digital literacy, um, help access employment and unemployment resources, and also gaining new job skills. And that's something that we kicked off earlier this month. It's available 
um, online through virtual conferencing, through email, phone, and text. Uh, your next skill is something that we've had for a while, but we've kind of increased our capacity around this. And it's, you can actually submit a request to the library to learn any skill, any hobby or language, and then our team will send you a free personalized learning plan within about four days. And those are available for kids, um, teens, adults to develop skills for work, again, school or hobbies. Um, similarly, we have Library to Business, an existing program that has been shifting, uh, offering webinars and one-on-one -on -one appointments in English and Spanish, supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got free art classes for folks 50 and above. Um, a lot of virtual story times uh, are have been captured uh, via Facebook and are available on YouTube in multiple languages, and we'll, those will keep coming throughout the summer. We've got some upcoming author events and readings online. And then lastly here is um, kind of a neat project to help collect people's stories about how they're experiencing life in this moment during the time of COVID. And so we'll be collecting those stories and adding them to the library's special collections to kind of document this um, interesting moment in our shared history. So lots of other things in the work, but uh, that is a snapshot. Next slide, please. So uh, one thing that I definitely wanted to mention today is that uh, with everything going on, um, we are a, a resource um, for learning and we've got some great resources developed by our librarians um, to, to help people in their, in their learning of things like systemic racism. And so in addition to supporting community with programs and services, we've got, I've put up here a couple different um, reading lists. So the first is a toolkit for anti-racism um, allies, and it's got a whole host of mostly books, eBooks, audiobooks. Some of them are available all the time. Um, if, if you've noticed, a lot of these have made it to the top of the New York Times bookseller list for weeks and weeks now, which is great. People are doing a lot of reading and hopefully that reading and learning will, you know, move into reflecting and acting and um, and it will continue over time. So we also have a number of great children's book lists um, highlighting black excellence, black authors, uh, a number of lists around race and social justice for a variety of ages. And I just want to say that um, myself as a parent of young children, I have definitely been turning to books in this time to help explain, you know, big things like systemic racism to my three, six and eight year old and and how there are systems that have been designed. Um, and in doing so and reaching out for new books, um, we can really help build empathy and understanding amongst our uh, our children and amongst ourselves. And I think that's really important in this time, um, but not just in this moment. This is obviously an ongoing effort. So I do hope that folks on this call and out in the community will remember that the library is really an ongoing resource in this space and our librarians are continually updating and creating new new lists like this. So my last slide, please. Thank you. So lastly, I wanted to share information about an upcoming event that the library is hosting in partnership with Seattle Together, which is a collection of several other city departments and partners um, working to connect community in this time of social distancing. So it's called Love in the Time of COVID. It is an online event on Thursday, July 9th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, it is highlighting Black, Indigenous, and people of color solidarity and will feature an all-star lineup of artists and community activists coming together to uplift unity during the pandemic. So um, I hope you will check that out on July 9th. And then I put a, a handful of links up here, but you can find most of the information that I've pointed to today, which was a lot in a short amount of time. Um, just visit our homepage, www.spl.org. And I think with that, um, thanks again for having us here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Allison. Um, I am very excited about the library reopening. Um, yes, personally. <laughs> personally. Uh, yeah, so uh, at this time, I would love to open it up. If anyone has any questions for Allison, um, you can hit star six on your phone. You can unmute your microphone. You can also email us at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov uh, if you'd like to write out your question. 
Um, does anybody have any questions for Allison in the library? Okay, seeing none and hearing none, I think we will continue. Allison, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you very much. Moving right along, uh, we are going to turn it to Rachel Shulkin from Seattle Parks and Recreation. Rachel, are you there? I'm here. Wonderful, you have the floor. So I'm gonna talk, um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk today about um, phase two in parks. So as many of you know, next slide, the county moved to phase two um, on June 19th. Uh, and one kind of interesting and also a little bit confusing is that um, the phase 1.5 direction for outdoor recreation um, is the same as the phase two um, direction for outdoor recreation. So there aren't any changes there. Um, which was nice for us. So we'd had um, kind of the announcement of these changes in effect for probably about the two, week and a half, two weeks prior to the move to change to uh, phase two. Um, but before we were telling people to keep it moving and kind of what we meant by that is that we wanted people to be running, walking, biking, not sitting, um, not picnicking, not um, gathering in parks. But now that we're in phase two, um, kind of our new motto is keep it small, simple, and socially distant. So the real um, thing that people need to take away is that parks are open, but gatherings should be small, meaning less than five people. So really, really small. So that's no barbecues, no birthday parties, no pickup games, um, no kind of larger organized activities or the events that you typically have during the summer. Next slide. Um, so a couple of things that did happen um, that the governor and the Washington Department of Health were able to release additional information on um, fields, athletic fields are now open for reservations and our first um, kind of date that people will actually start assuming resuming activity on those fields will be July 1st. So that's just next Wednesday, um, but it's for, but the direction was practices, no games. So no tournaments, um, no games, just practices. And then the Washington Department of Health has a pretty um, detailed document of how those need to look and the plans that leagues and sports um, need to have in place in order to be eligible to be playing on those fields. And those are things like being in pods of five, um, keeping players distant, sanitizing equipment, making sure that there's hand washing and sanitation available for players. Um, um, and so, you know, should you or know someone who's in a league, has a league or, um, is wondering why your kids baseball hasn't resumed yet you feel free to reach out and see if they have kind of dug into these new guidelines and have reached out to the city to see if there's a way that they can um, get get kids back on the field and do so in a safe way um, but i will say that when the fields are not reserved they are open for informal play but you need to keep that group um, relatively small again that rule of under five is still at play next slide so uh, with that, um, tennis courts and basketball courts are also reopened. Um, so again, we're looking for small group play. So with tennis, that looks like no tournaments. Um, it looks like if you're waiting for your turn to play, don't, don't line up alongside the court. Um, that's kind of one of the things we've noticed, a line of eight, 10 people lining up alongside the court. That's not going to be the safest decision. Um, of course, bring your own equipment, make sure that you have um, the ability to that you're socially distanced from anyone who does not live in your household um, and then wash your hands both before and after and then completely stay home if you're sick. Um, we did open basketball courts because we just wanted to make sure that we were doing things as equitably as possible in um, allowing people to make choices to use basketball courts in a way that was still um, follow these guidelines. So if you're familiar with the games horse or around the world or just shooting around um, we encourage folks to get out there. If you're playing a one on one or a small game with folks within your household, that's fine. But um, we're asking that there's not full five on five games um, that would not be in line with the phase two guidance. Next slide. Boat ramps are open. So we have opened all boat ramps across the city. Um, there are parking lots associated with those boat ramps and those are open. Um, particularly the motorized boat ramp parking lot. So Don Armini, Atlantic Street, 14th Street, 
um, Magnuson, um, the one down at Shell Shoal and um, Stan Sayers are all popular places that people want to launch their boats during um, the summer and those spaces are open um, for folks to put their boats in the water. But we want to remind folks that the parking lots at those spots are for boat parking only. That's true in COVID times and in non-COVID times. Um, and it really is difficult for boat boaters when um, non-boaters take up those parking spots. So we ask that people respect that rule. Next slide. So our beaches. Um, so we're able to open a smaller, but um, still some beaches this summer. And we're really excited about being able to do that um, for the community. So those open July 1st, which is Wednesday. That's Pritchard Beach and Rainier Beach, Mount Baker in the Mount Baker neighborhood, Madison Beach and Madison Valley. Um, Matthews Beach, which is in the Sand Point neighborhood, and then Green Lake. Um, I think it's the East Green Lake one. There's two at Green Lake, um, but the, just the East Green Lake one will reopen. So, um, you know, what we're asking folks again is groups of five and under, make sure you have six feet of space between you and others. You know, we, um, you heard a few people talk about the mask requirements. And um, if you heard, they said, you don't have to wear a mask when you're outside if you can have six feet of space. So the beach is a place, depending on the day and depending on the crowding, that you might not, not be able to have that six feet of space. So if you feel like it's getting a little crowded, more crowded on the beach, um, feel free to put that mask on when you're not in the water um, just to keep yourself safe. Um, and for the safety of our lifeguards, we're, we have moved the rope line in a bit. So we're kind of hoping that folks will stay about chest high and below. Um, and that's really to lessen the chance that there's going to be water rescues. And within mind that water rescues would require some very close to close contact between you and a lifeguard, um, and then increasing the risk of the transmission of COVID-19 in that way. So um, our goal with that is really to help keep us as safe as possible while being able to provide this recreation opportunity. Um, you know, little kids need to be supervised when they are at the beach, but we do have some trained lifeguards out there. Um, you know, it's limited due to the city's hiring freeze. We hire a bunch of temps, summer lifeguards, which is a great teen opportunity that we're unfortunately not able to offer this year. Um, but we have reassigned many of our pool lifeguards to the beaches this summer, just to be able to make sure that we have um, this fun and hopefully safe um, opportunity for people to get into the water when the weather gets warm. Next slide. Um, so the summer food program has begun and I heard the libraries talking about some activities that they'll be doing there. Um, so there's a variety of locations across Seattle and um, the we at Parks and Rec operate quite a few of them. I think a little bit um, less than 20 of them across the city. Um, and just please go on our website or our blog to get more information about those. But that's a free lunch open to anyone under the age of 18, no ID needed. Um, and there's no income qualification. Um, you can just show up, get a meal for everyone who's under 18. Um, typically, the way that this program works is that you did need to eat it on site, but from but because of COVID-19, we are allowing some grab and go lunch. And I just want to reiterate because we say this every year and people always ask questions, all people are welcome. And kind of part of the rationale there is that you know, with kids home, there's an added cost of feeding them um, during a meal that you typically don't have to feed them. And so whether you consider yourself to need that or not, you know, it is an added um, cost to a lot of families. And if, um, if it would benefit your family to take advantage of the program, I really encourage you to do so. The meals are different every day and they're nutritious and kids like them. They're, there's always a couple chocolate milk days um, on um, each week. So um, please get out there. Next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to um, kind of finish up with the, reminding that gatherings just really need to be small. So phase three does allow us to get into groups of 50, but we're not there yet. So five people and under really does mean small. So that um, kind of leads to some regulations that we still have in place um, for our larger parks. We're asking that people go home after sunset um, and we're keeping parking lots closed at our major parks. And those are pretty unpopular decisions that we've made. Um, but from you know, the decades that people have worked at Parks and Recreation, par there are many parks that are incredibly crowded in the summer and summer days. And what we've heard from folks leading up into this um, pandemic was that people are not able to get the six feet of space that they need 
when the park is really crowded. So, you know, I can give you a few examples of Golden Gardens Beach, which you have seen pictures where it's basically body to body on the beach. Um, folks are saying at Karkeek Park, there's bottlenecks on the trail where people are bunching up. So those are the kind of things that we see when parks get overcrowded. Um, and so at this time, you know, what are some things you can do? You can recreate closer to home, take advantage of the, the safe streets that um, SDOT has put in place for people to be out and about um, closer to home. Visit some of your local parks. Over 90% of us live within 10 minutes of a, of a park. We have over 485 parks. There's natural spaces. Um, um, get creative, get out there. Um, we want you to be outside and enjoy yourself, but we just really need to do so safely. And we just don't want parks to become a space where people are congregating to the point that we're spreading COVID-19. So um, just a reminder, you know, keep gathering small, but um, we encourage you to get out there and enjoy the park. I think that's it for me. Rachel, thank you so much for that. Um, a lot of good information there. Um, at this time, I'm gonna open it up to see if there are any questions for Rachel uh, with the Parks Department. Uh, anything on her presentation or any questions the community may have. Again, star six to unmute your phones. You may unmute your microphones and your computer. Uh, you can also email COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov and we will read your question out loud as well. Are there any questions for Rachel at this time? Yes, I have a question. Please continue. So Rachel mentioned that parking was going to be open for the boat loading, um, but then those spaces are not available for the general public. Will the other parking spaces be available? And I'm talking uh, specifically about Seward Park and the loop and down in that area. I was down there last weekend and disappointed because it was closed. And it was a nice day and, you know, um, you can park in the neighborhood around there, but then everyone had the same idea and there was no parking. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, if the parking was going to be available. Thank no, you. No, we're still going to keep major park parking lots closed, probably up until phase three. And the goal of that really is that less people would visit the park. So, you know, Kind of some tips and tricks that I have are that if you find it hard to visit the park because the parking lot is closed, some ideas would be find a different park. Other idea would be go to that park earlier in the day or later in the afternoon. Really earlier in the day is what we find is the least busy time. You're going to be able to park in the neighborhood a lot easier. Um, what we have provided is that a variety of those larger parks, there is ADA parking, Seward being one of those. So. Um, if folks need those spots, you can see um, there's a big placard and it shows you where to go if you need ADA parking. But because we are trying to keep less people in the park, we're going to continue to keep the parking lots closed in order to help and reinforce that message that we want to see less traffic in some of our busier, more crowded parks. Uh, Winstock, thank you so much for that question. Are there any other questions for Rachel in the Parks Department? Hi, yes, this is Wang Wang from DON. Um, hi, Rachel. Uh, I got this question from some community members where they were asking what social distance ambassadors are and what they do. Yeah, so, um, you know, when this pandemic began, um, our superintendent Jesus Aguirre was really committed to keeping our parks open throughout the entire thing, even as um, cities across the country were forced to close their parks because there was so much congregating as other amenities like movie theaters and malls and things closed down, people were hitting the parks, which we love, um, but we just really needed to do so in a safe way. So um, we created social distance ambassadors. And so what we did, we took a lot of staff whose jobs um, we're no longer relevant during COVID-19 and we reassign them this, to this position. It's a strictly educational role and it's a data collection role. So all they're doing is reminding people of the guidelines and then they're taking data to help the parks department better assess where we're having trouble um, finding social distancing and with or with park crowding or, or major congregation. But 
Um, they're there just to help people know um, about six feet, feet of distancing, about not holding parties, um, not holding pickup games at this time. Um, that's what they're out there to do. They have no enforcement authority. They do not ticket. They do not. They have no no role um, related to SPD or any kind of enforcement. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Seeing none and hearing none, I think we are going to continue. Again, there will be a question and answer portion at the end as well. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, at this time, we will be moving on. Uh, I'd like to introduce Darius Foster with the Seattle Office of Labor Standards. Darius, are you there? I'm here. Wonderful. All right, we'll get started. Can we go to the next slide? All right, so um, thanks for the opportunity to engage uh, the community and my fellow colleagues. Um, I certainly want to be mindful of the time allotted to me. So um, I want to begin by introducing OLS to first time listeners and in turn provide a refresher to those who are familiar with OLS. So uh, OLS, the Seattle Office of Labor Standards. So so let's let's dive in. So OLS it's is a city department and it was established in 2015 after uh, following the historic passage of Seattle's minimum wage ordinance. Uh, to implement and enforce Seattle's labor laws. Now, these laws are not all inclusive, are not inclusive of every labor law. Rather, uh, these are laws that have been passed by voter initiative and, and city council. And so, these laws apply to to employees who who work within the city limits, uh, regardless of where the employer is located. Uh, and the jurisdiction of the office is is uh, confined to Seattle city limits. Now, uh, for those who are following online. Um, uh, you'll see that there's a list of 15 uh, labor laws. It's really one through 11 with the 11th law, hotel employee protections, including really four separate laws. And so uh, I'm not going to read those all those laws out loud for those who may not be following online, but uh, just for the sake of time. But most employers are covered under the first four laws listed. I will read those out loud. Minimum wage, wage theft, paid sick and save time, fair chance and uh, fair chance employment. Um, and, and half, more than half of the laws that uh, my office uh, enforces are industry specific. Okay? And so, for example, hotel employer protections only apply to the hotel industry. Right? And uh, uh, the domestic workers ordinance is specific to domestic workers who provide paid services to uh, an individual or household uh, as, a, as a nanny, uh, house cleaner, gardener, or home care worker. Now. Some laws may overlap or even seem contradictory to state and or federal laws. And so uh, one example is there's a minimum wage statute that exists at every level of government, right? There's a federal uh, minimum wage, there's state minimum wage, and then there's Seattle minimum wage. Um, and to, to mix things up a bit, Washington state also has paid sick leave and fair chance employment statutes, which for the most part mirror uh, Seattle, Seattle statutes. So, one way uh, to think about all of these laws and, and your rights, whether you're an employee or your obligations if you're an employer and you have folks who work in the city, is that in general, labor laws are in, enacted to protect the rights of workers. And so, therefore, when there's a conflict between federal, state, and local laws, laws that provide the highest standard of protection uh, and the strictest standard uh, uh, for employees generally prevails. And so that's why Seattle is able to have a higher minimum wage in the state and, and, and federal and at the federal level. Uh, next slide, please. So to kind of dive into uh, some of the new de recent developments that's been happening, um, you know, City Council has re recently passed COVID specific uh, legislation uh, to protect workers. And so uh, this includes the gig worker paid sick and safe time ordinance and the gig worker premium pay ordinance that was recently passed uh, within uh, one was signed uh, last week and we're expecting the one that was signed last week was the, or went into effect last week was the uh, a gig worker pacing safe time ordinance and the the ordinance that we're uh, awaiting mayor's uh, the mayor's signature is the gig worker premium pay ordinance. So um, gig worker PSST uh, what that does is it temporarily provides paid sick leave for gig workers during the COVID-19 emergency. Okay, and so uh, although it was signed. Um, uh, Kind of made official last week. It doesn't go into effect until July 13th. Okay, and so 
uh, once it goes into effect, it will end 180 days after either the termination of the mayor's civil emergency or the termination of any concurrent civil emergency uh, applicable to, to Seattle in response to, to COVID-19, right? Whichever, whichever one is later. Uh, when we talk about the gig worker premium pay ordinance, uh, uh, this ordinance requires food delivery network companies such as Postmates uh, and Grubhub to provide gig workers with uh, a $2.50 premium pay per order performed in Seattle during the COVID-19 public health crisis. Okay, and so uh, the legislation also requires companies to give their employees premium pay until the end of the city's civil emergency. Um, and it prohibits companies from passing premium pay on to customers ordering uh, the delivery of groceries, and it cannot be counted as part of customer tips, bonuses, and commissions. Okay, and so uh, the, the law defines a gig worker to mean uh, means a food delivery network company wor uh, worker or a transportation network uh, company driver. Okay. Uh, so these are. These two pieces of legislation are specific to what's happening right now, right? And so we'll go into effect fairly soon. Uh, one thing to note, the gig worker premium pay will be effective yes. as soon as it's signed by, by the mayor. Okay. Um, also, in the wake of, of COVID, uh, the hotel employer protection laws uh, will go into effect July 1. Now, these, these laws are not specific to the pandemic that's happening now. They were... Uh, made official last year, but they go into effect July 1. So something to be cognizant of for, for, for folks who may be uh, familiar with folks who work in the industry. Uh, and um, these... Sorry, I hear some background noise there. All right. Uh, so these protections include uh, safety protections uh, for hotel workers, uh, protecting hotel employees from injury, improving hotel employees' access to medical care, uh, and hotel employee job retention. So all of these laws will go into effect July 1. Uh, lastly, what I, what I want to do is highlight two commonly asked questions related to paid sick and safe time and secure scheduling. And so these laws are not uh, new by any regards, but we have a lot of employers reaching out to us um, because uh, you know, as they're reopening, they have questions that, that pertain to these, these two laws. And so the first question that I want to, that I want to uplift is the one that relates to paid sick and safe time. And so generally, uh, what we've noticed is that there's been a lot of employees who have been furloughed. And so they are going to be returning back to work soon. And so, uh, the question is, you know, what happens with the paid sick and safe time that they've accrued, but since they've been out for so long and once they return, do they kind of start a, is that, you know, do they still have access to that? Are there protections that still exist? And so uh, the, the answer to that is yes, right? There's not going to be, that employee will start off from where they're left off. They, they, they do not have to begin anew. They're not going to lose any unused time. Uh, you know, whatever they've used, that'll be calculated. Whatever they have they've available, that'll be uh, reinstated. Um, it's only after an absence of 12 months uh, right, where uh, – that no longer exists. But in that case, um, that person would no longer be an employee. So this is specific. I wanted to address, you know, folks who are have been furloughed but returning to work. So it's not the case if someone has been uh, let go and then rehired. That's a different circumstance, right? That that individual will then start anew in terms of accrual, uh, the waiting period, if there's one that exists, and then uh, uh, moving forward, okay? Uh, the next question that I want to highlight pertains to the secure scheduling ordinance. Uh, and it has to do with the advance notice of a work schedule, right? So the law requires employers to provide 14 days advance notice of a work schedule. Um, and so this is, a, a lot of employers are reaching out to the office and saying, listen, we, we don't know exactly when we're opening up. Uh, it's kind of hard for us to provide 14 days advance up front. Uh, is that something that we're gonna have to do? And so uh, the answer is no, right? So under most circumstances, an employer must provide employees with 14 days advance notice of their work schedule. Uh, for new employees and for existing employees who are returning to work after a leave of absence, uh, including an absence due to the closure of a business by a public official's order, the employer may provide the employee with a written work schedule okay, that runs through the last date of the existing schedule. So they can just they can buy, provide them one with one, you know, as as soon as as soon as available, right? It doesn't have to be 14 days before they think or they know they're going to open. Um, but once they, they're on schedule, and then from that point moving forward, the employer will be obligated to provide 
an employee with uh, a scheduled in advance. So for uh, you know community members who support uh, you know uh, workers in, in various sectors, uh, they may be covered under. Well, generally this this law only pertains to retailers and food service establishments with at least 500 or more employees worldwide. So uh, we're, we're talking about um, you know some of your franchises uh, and uh, big box retailers. Um, so next slide, please. So certainly I you know, unpacked a lot of information and speaking rather fast just because of the sake of time, but just uh, wanted folks to be aware that, hey, we do offer certain, we do offer services to assist with compliance and understanding of these laws. Uh, you know, we do offer outreach and education. There is technical assistance to workers and employers, uh, in addition to, you know, obviously investigations that we conduct. Um, aside from that, we have templates online, online uh, questions and answers documents. Uh, workplace posters, and then rules that further assist someone's understanding of the provisions established within these laws. And so uh, I am well aware that there's a lot of, there's uh, very complex language associated with these laws, and we do have some uh, comprehensive materials to really break that down. But you know what, folks, I've been doing this for some time, and there's always, sometimes I don't have uh, the immediate answer, and everything pertains to a case-by-case -case scenario. So uh, generally, um, you know, Quest answers may 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 be altered or, or reworded differently based on what what the scenario actually is. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so you know what I think. Uh, there's a lot of language that I have about uh, you know what happens if someone wants to contact our office. Uh, you know whether you're an employer or employee. Um, you know we. I won't take too much time uh, uh, speaking about that, only because then I know we're pressed for time. The last slide that I have has to do with my contact, the contact information of the office. Um, but really, that's uh, um, you know that's posted uh, just a general uh, Google search. You know, uh, Seattle Office Labor Standards. You'll get you'll get that same information: the email, uh, uh, a phone number, uh, and and the online uh, possibly submitting an online intake form to address your question. So. Um, uh, sorry for the rapid fire towards the end, but uh, I was just made aware that we uh, we, we have some other good speakers that we want to hear and uh, a lot of good information. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you, guys. Darius, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, as Darius mentioned, we have uh, just shy of 10 minutes left. Um, we still have two more wonderful presentations coming up, uh, two speakers. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we probably will run a little past four o'clock. We will do our best, but um, there's uh, it's our first webinar in a month and we have a lot of information. So Darius, uh, I thank you for your presentation. I think I'm going to hold off on any questions for Office of Labor Standards to our Q&A portion, if that's okay. And I think we're gonna continue with our presentation. So now, uh, I would like to introduce Chris Swenson from Major uh, Special Major Events, Special Events Committee. Chris, oh, and Mark Jones. Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking, so hopefully everybody can hear me. This is my first attempt or first experience with WebEx as well. We can hear you, Chris. Thank you. Okay, great. And and never and you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> uh, we uh, were. Uh, planning on a quick presentation, so four to five minutes, we'll try to keep to that. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, the Department of Neighborhoods and everyone inviting us to this conversation about uh, where we are in reopening. We, we the community and the city and the county. Um, this is uh, uh, our conversation, Mark and my, will be specific to major events, which is a little bit down the road. So we're looking ahead a little bit on, on what can happen and but we wanted to, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk about where we are and all of that and what to expect. Um, I am Chris Swenson. I'm the chair of the Special Events Committee, Seattle Chair, uh, Special Events Committee. I'm also the acting director of the Seattle Office of Film and Music, which oversees that. We're part of the Office of Economic Development. Uh, that photo that you're looking at is a pre-COVID photo. I'm not going to open my video because it's I'm a during COVID experience with my beard and my hair, so uh, that's not going to happen. Next slide, please. Um, I'll be speaking to the Special Events Committee, and Mark with the Seattle Center will be speaking to campus uh, activities as well. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, the Special Events Committee is the group, is the 21-member group of intergovernmental safety and regulation uh, experts uh, who 
collectively review over 500 major events that happen each year in Seattle. Um, this weekend is Pride Weekend. We, uh, under normal circumstances, would be uh, starting off actually with a couple events today. Um, actually, I think even yesterday was, there, there was some activity as well scheduled for Pride Weekend. We, as an example, uh, Pride Weekend, uh, we co help coordinate a dozen permitted major events, three of which are free speech marches and rallies, many of which are community events and some are also uh, commercial events. Uh, put together by um, businesses up on Capitol Hill. So this is normally an extremely busy, an example of an extremely busy weekend for us. And unfortunately that is not, those events are not happening right now. Um, but that's an example of the work that the committee does. Um, as was discussed earlier by King County Public Health or Seattle King County Public Health um, and the King County Executive's Office, we're in phase two and under Washington's phased approach, uh, major events don't even, get a consideration until phase four, and that's with 50 or more people. And the special events committee is responsible for overseeing events that are 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 people. And as everyone, as you've heard from everyone, there's no indicator or no indication of when those events can actually happen again. So the work that the special event committee is doing right now is on hold as far as uh, issuing permits. However, uh, and, and because of that, um, and because there is so much work that needs to be done uh, by the committee and reviewed by the committee in order to approve these events, it takes a minimum of 90 days to do that per event. So the third bullet here, I uh, wanted to share with everybody that a couple weeks ago at the beginning of June, the special event committee made a uh, decision to not issue any special event permit through Labor Day. And that's because the committee and the uh, organizers just have no time to do that anymore. We're two and a half months away from Labor Day and there's not enough planning time or expectation on where major events will be able to reopen under the state's phased approach. So that is happening now. The, uh, as we get closer to Labor Day, this committee will again consider whether to extend that or not. And this is an administration role that they're talking about, just the ability to say yes or no to events. So that's the work, that is part of the work that the committee is doing right now. The committee is also developing a processing framework for when major events are allowed to happen. So it's a new world in every sense of the word. And the um, committee, uh, while not processing anything, needs to be prepared and make sure that organizers are prepared to provide information that will meet social distancing or health standards as they roll out in the future. So that's the priority of the work that the committee is doing right now. Uh, the committee and our office are also working with the Seattle Center, SDOT, Department of Neighborhoods, Parks and Arts on initiatives that um, can allow for virtual or alternative activations. Uh, the Seattle Together was uh, initiative was mentioned a little bit ago. Um, that's an example of that. And I think Mark has a couple other examples as well. So that's the kind of the framework for the major events work that the city of Seattle and the special event committee um, are doing right now. And a little bit of a look ahead uh, without really under knowing what that look ahead looks like. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over, if you can go to the next slide and I'll hand it over to Mark with the Seattle Center who can talk about the campus. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Hopefully yes, you can. Yes, we can hear you, Mark. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Patty, for having us today. Um, I'm Mark Jones. I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development at Seattle Center. And we are, Seattle Center is currently operating under basically emergency and essential services only, and we're hosting two shelters in both Fisher Pavilion and the X Hall. Um, we've been working really hard with all our resident orgs, um, developing rent relief, rent deferral, and other programs to help out and support them in this trying time of closure. Um, Seattle Center has also been, um, in addition to the large scale events, we're also delaying or moving our summer events online. Um, so we're actively trying to shift gears quite a bit. You can go to the next slide. So we have developed um, Seattle Center Studios, which is an avert, a virtual event studio set up at McCaw Hall. And we are currently working through the health protocols to start hosting um, more outside events in there. We've done some internal activities and events in that studio, but our goal is to move um, all of our Festall community events online this summer. We've been also working with our resident orgs to highlight um, our activities, their activities, and a program called Arts at Home, which you can find at seattlecenter.com, more details. 
we're really highlighting everything from the ballet, the opera, all of their online programming. Um, and then Chris will already mentioned this, but we are also working on the collaboration for Seattle together with our other um, city departments to promote and activate active and online arts programs. And we are also, you know, really trying to do our best to figure out, as Chris said, when we can safely return and gather. Um, it's going to be a long time before we have major um, festivals and activities on the campus. Um, but we are, you know, still working on a lot of infrastructure projects. We have a big exciting announcement that was made yesterday. If you go to the next slide. Um, we actually, we are in the process of building our new arena on campus with our partners at Oakview and they were able to secure a new partner with Amazon who is focusing on their climate pledge initiative. And we're actually naming the arena climate pledge arena. So that was an exciting, it's going to be a long, long-term partnership. The building is going to be focused on really green initiatives, everything from wastewater um, from the building and rainwater being used to not wastewater, but rainwater being used actually to produce um, and make ice. So this, so the, the new team name coming hopefully in fall um, will be playing on rainwater um, frozen ice, which is very exciting. And there's a many other green initiatives. Their goal is to be plastic free. Um, net emissions um, over the next several years as they come online. We are excited and hope um, to see the new arena open in September. Uh, so, in addition to the arena, we've got a lot of other exciting projects in the process. We're doing some upgrades to the armory um, exterior with some new signage um, and new paint um, and some new awnings, etc. And in addition, we're working on some other programs, um, making some upgrades to the fountain. Um, as we prepare for the big grand reopening in October of 2021 with the arena. So our goal right now is to really, since it's likely that events um, are not going to be able to be held in person for a while, we are shifting and working really hard to try to create um, a presentation through the Seattle Center studio. So all of this information about our virtual events, the studios, the arena can be found at seattlecenter.com. And that's, I'm going to wrap that up real quick. Since I know we're sensitive on time. So if there's any questions. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Chris. Um, yes, I will open it up for any questions for them. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can ask. So at this time, we will also have a very short Q and a portion at the end. I think. If I don't hear any, I will go on. So thank you very much. Mark and Chris. Uh, we will be moving on now, as we mentioned, we were now uh, incorporating some uh, community and uh, organizations um, to our webinar. And today we have the pleasure of having Refugee Artisan Initiative and Ming Ming. Ming Ming, are you there? Ming Ming, you may be muted. You can hit star six if you're on the phone or you can unmute Hi, your. Can you Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Ming Ming, okay. you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, 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 um, I'm actually on the phone, but I do have my computer so I can go through the slide. Great, so just let us know when you want the next slide. Okay. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Mimi Chung Edelman. I'm the executive director for the Refugee Artist Initiative. Uh, I am an immigrant from Taiwan and also a clinical pharmacist. Um, combining my passion and, and my love of fashion, started this organization over four years ago. And next slide is our mission slide. Um, our mission is to transform lives of refugees and immigrants women uh, giving a sustainable work in uh, sewing and handcrafting goods right here in Seattle area. Next slide. Which our program is a home based program, knowing that there are so many barriers for this population, language, transportation, child care, and our case even physical disability. And we provide them a personal uh, a home tr uh, based training and also give them tools such as phone machines and other things that to get them set up so they can work from home at their own time and able to generate uh, living wages and support their families. And we'll, we'll find market for the goods they make. Next slide. 
Oh, our products are made from donated fabric right here in Seattle. We have two days a week donation uh, and also gather from fabric from other uh, companies around Seattle. And these are examples of the things we make them into jewelry, home accessories, and kitchen goods. And you can find them in uh, stores, online, and even events. So the next slide illustrates is um, b before COVID, we have six women. We have uh, our artisans primarily through our partnership with uh, resettlement agencies, such as Refugee Women's Alliance um, and our partner, um, Children's Home Society Washington. Next slide. Uh, we were a primary home-based program, and then uh, last summer, we finally have our first uh, space here in Lake City, uh, what we'll call it the business incubator, our maker space, uh, where we do um, training and gathering clients. And right now, COVID, as you can imagine, was where we um, have a lot of PPE returned to us at this place. Next slide. As I mentioned to you that I'm a, I'm a clinical pharmacist, I was really struck when COVID hit that our state of Washington did not have enough PPE for myself as a healthcare provider and for many others. Uh, when the governor announced that there's no school uh, because of the COVID, the very next day, I started a GoFundMe campaign page, uh, refugee and immigrants make gears against COVID-19. Up to date, we have close to 40,000 money raised, and that's the money we use to make close to 7,000 pieces uh, of PPE for donation. Next slide. As I say, we have um, over 50,000 actually uh, PPE made and donated over 60,000 PPE nationally. These are examples of the people that we donate the uh, PPE to healthcare workers, frontline workers, nursing homes, correctional centers, both for the staff and for the prisoners postal workers around the country, and lately the Navajo Nation, which has uh, been hit, um, one of the hardest hit in the country. Next slide. Um, because of what we do, uh, we get um, connected with other uh, groups. Bill and Nash is an international artisan group that commissioned us to make masks so our artisan can continue to work at home and make income, along with City of Seattle, King County Metro, Guardian Insurance in New York, along with Metropolitan Market, are our bulk order clients. Next slide. Here are some examples. Um, if you shop around Metropolitan Market, which is a local market around Seattle, you can find both adults and children and kids masks that are made by our artisans. And again, um, um, and uh, so you guys may wonder, how can we have uh, made so, so many masks so quickly? because our partnership with another company called California Design Dam, they have a warehouse down in five that donate a lot of fat, uh, that have a lot of unused bed sheets, 100% cotton. They're actually the best kind of material to make into masks. So we utilize what's available and make them into masks quickly to meet the need of the community. Next slide. Uh, as of yesterday, um, we also launched two masks um, pro, a program, uh, one's Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matters, and Vote Math. And with 20% of the sale will go to ACLU to support the work they do in equity and fairness for our community. Next slide. Um, these are some of the um, press we get, uh, particularly with Seattle Times. They actually um, put a step-to-step -step how to make your own mask uh, by using the sampled mask that we make to, to donate and sell to the public. Next slide. Well, other PPE will also make face shields uh, that we donate. And recently, we start partnering, partnering up with REI uh, because uh, the idea of disposable gowns are really wasteful and not good for the environment. We're working with REI on, on securing material to make re reusable gowns. And I'm asking the community to see, are there other partners? We know that dentist's office need them. And we'll also see if any other parts of the city and area may need to use reusable gowns. These are gowns you can use and wash and reuse up to 10 times before you, you uh, dispose them to landfill. So we think that if something as COVID continue to hit our community uh, with a shortage of 
disposable gowns who want to be a solution to the problem and by also giving our artisan another skill set to learn making gowns. Next slide. Because the COVID, we were able to add six more artisans through partnership with Rewa. We work with the case managers from Afghanistan and from Burma. So these are the six ladies we just add on to our program. So finally, what are the goals? We know that in order for these women to have a pathway to be successful, they need, really need to have more training, learning lean manufacturing and learning how to sell other products that people need and want. So we're hoping that to have apprenticeship program. And finally, um, we also work with a local company called Sistema Design to try to uh, make locally made school uniform for this fall. So there's another way to, to give them another skill set and continue a sustainable income for these women. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Miming, thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us the work that you're doing with uh, Refugee Artisan Initiative. Um, at this time, I think we will be going into Q&A. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Ming Ming and the work that she is doing with the Artisan, uh, Refugee Artisan Initiative, you can hit star six on your phone to unmute. You can unmute your microphones as well. Uh, and you can email us uh, now or later if you think of a question to COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. Um, I think I'm going to open it up for any questions at this time, general questions any for any of our presenters. Uh, feel free to ask at this time. I believe we have some uh, hands raised as well. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Elsa. Elsa, if you want to unmute your microphone and ask a question. Sorry, that was a mistake. Thank you. Okay. No worries. Uh, again, this technology is new to all of us and we are all learning uh, together. So no worries. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I think I'm going to give it just one more minute for anyone to go ahead and ask a question. See none and hearing none. And seeing none in our email. Right. Excuse me. This is Jean. Mike D has yes. his hand raised. Please, Mike, go ahead. Mike, are you there? Sorry, I didn't unmute. Okay. I wanted to thank, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I wanted to thank you for using this this other technology. The other stuff was confusing and it seemed like people were having trouble with that too. So I understand you took some time off and I'm glad you came back with this. And I've been able to use this with other things like the Joint Information Center does this stuff. And so thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yes, um, we have, uh, we did take some time off to work on the uh, platform and to just regroup um, on what this webinar is and uh, how best to provide upcoming uh, relevant and accurate information to our community as well as involving more community members and organizations. So thank you for that comment, Mike. Uh, if there are there any other questions? Jean, uh, as host, do you see any other hands up? No, I don't see any other hands up. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap up our Q&A portion now and uh, we are over time, so I think we will be wrapping up this webinar. Um, there are a list of community resources here. Uh, we'd like to highlight some of these efforts. Uh, they are on various different topics. Uh, the slide has a lot of links, but if you know of any other efforts that should be highlighted as the conversation unfolds, I invite you to include a note in, uh, to email us at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov or uh, give us a call uh, again. To, um, I want to take this time to also thank all of our presenters and speakers. Um, 
this has been a uh, transition period for, like I said, for us, for all of us. Uh, I appreciate your everyone's patience, everyone's participation. We can't do these webinars without you. Um, we will be doing these webinars on the second and fourth Fridays of the month from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Uh, we are changing our time from weekly to twice a month. Uh, so you will find us here uh, every other Friday, well, the second and fourth Fridays, 2.30 to 4. Um, and you can continue to help us improve these webinars through our uh, survey. We appreciate your feedback. We love your feedback. We, we encourage your feedback. Uh, these webinars are recorded and they will be available on the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods blog at frontporch.seattle.gov. Um, if you would like to receive a copy of the slide presentation, please email us again at COVID-19 community webinars at seattle.gov. You can call us also at 206-684-0464. Uh, you can also call the Seattle Customer Service Bureau at 206-684-2489 for general information about the city's COVID-19 response. We will be back on July 17th, no, July 10th. We'll be back July 10th at 2.30 for our next webinar. Uh, again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. And this webinar is now concluded. Have a great weekend, everyone.